So we want to remember Memorial Day and those folks who have died for us to have the freedoms that, that we have and to remember that time. On two weeks from now, we'll be having our combined worship service at 9.30, so you get to come a little bit later, and then we'll be having the voters meeting after that. The agenda is posted out in the lobby area. We also thank all those folks who have brought stuff in to choose hope and help women that are having babies and women that have had babies and that material. You'll have in your bulletin a little flyer that talks about our next mission that we're doing, and it's literally the mission that 11 folks from church are going on down to Guatemala, and there's all kinds of medicine and other things that they need, and so if you can look at that and be bringing those in between now and when we go on June 23rd, um, and then we also are in need of folks to help out with what we're calling the Kids Summer Series, so we're going to be having that um, as a part of what we do here in the worship area and then in the gym, if you can help with that or help with being a Sunday school teacher next year, please put that on your Connect card. That would be of great help. And one other thing that isn't today and it isn't until the end of the month, but it's this week, is we like to celebrate birthdays. And we actually have a group of six folks that are turning 90 this year and uh, Ann Mezoff. If you want to stand up, Anne, so they know who you are, she'll be turning 90 this year. So we commemorate that. Well, let's stand and begin our worship. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole army, the whole of earth is full of his glory. God showed his love among us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Almighty God, we are called to confess you as the God who has no equal. You are three distinct persons, yet one God. You are holy, we are not. You are righteous, we are not. Yet in your mercy, you foresaw our failings and made a way to redeem us from our sins and saw God were in need. We have not, not given Jesus full reign of our lives. We have not fully followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. Be gracious to us, and for the sake of Jesus our Redeemer, Grant us your forgiveness. Our Heavenly Father, who searches and knows all hearts, is gracious and merciful. Therefore, I ask you, before God and one another, is this your sincere confession? Yes, this is my sincere confession for God and my brothers and sisters in Christ. Hear the good news of this day, Jesus alone with the Father and the Spirit, has promised forgiveness to those who repent of their sins and turn to him. Your sins have been paid for by Christ. They are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God for his mercy and grace. Let us share Christ's peace with one another.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are three persons, yet one God, a mystery that is beyond our understanding. You ask us not to understand, but simply believe. Give us the faith of a child that we may trust and believe that you have said in your word. Guide us to walk in your light and share true fellowship with one another and with our Lord Jesus, true man, true God, and servant king. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Promise reading is from the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
new promise reading is from the book of Galatians, the fourth chapter. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you were doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith in the words of the Athanasian Creed. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefined will, without doubt, perish. 
perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this. That we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the God Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinities, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Spirit is almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, we also are prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is Lord. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but perceived. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this trinity, not as before, But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it also is necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is right faith that we believe and confess our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages. He is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether. Not by confusion of substance, but by unity of a person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again, their bodies and give account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the path of faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. 
Please be seated for the sermon here. beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Trinity Sunday is usually seen as the only feast day on the Christian calendar that's not based on a person or on an event. Like the birth of Christ, his baptism, his resurrection, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the conversion of St. Paul, but instead it is based on a doctrine? Let's pray. Almighty God, we acknowledge that we are unable to fully understand the depths of who you are in the Holy Trinity, but we rejoice in the clarity of which you have graciously given to us. Lord, by your spirit, would you open our hearts and minds this morning even more so we can gain a fuller understanding of this mystery. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with this principle. All Christians believe the doctrine of the Trinity. For if you do not believe this, that is, if you have come to a settled conclusion that the doctrine of the Trinity is not true, then you're not a Christian. In fact, you are a heretic. Now, these words may seem harsh, but they represent the Christian church since the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD. In fact, throughout the land, in every denomination, Christians throughout the centuries have united in proclaiming that our God exists in three persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, having said that, I admit that no one truly and fully understands it. It is, like we heard, a mystery and a paradox, yet we are given faith to believe it. 
So how do we go about explaining it? Well, in an excerpt from Concise Theology, noted Christian writer J.I. Packer wrote this. The historic doctrine of the Trinity confronts us with perhaps the most difficult thought that the human mind has ever been asked to handle. That's my topic of my sermon this morning. Quite a challenge, right? So if this is kind of difficult for you, you're in good company. The church believes that the one true God eternally exists in three persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Christianity is the only religion in the entire world that believes in the Trinity. Christians believe that God is one eternal being existing in three distinct persons. And as we heard, these three persons are co-equal and co-eternal, and they are worthy of the same worship, confidence, and obedience. One God in three persons. Back when I was a lawyer, there was a case about a man who was sitting at the defense table in his trial, and he murmured, please, God, just let me get away with this just once. Didn't know the microphone was on. The prosecution wanted to enter that statement as evidence against him. His attorney argued that this was a private confession between the accused and God. Well, it went on appeal, and ultimately the appeals court ruled it could be entered against him because the appeals court ruled that God is not a person. And as a young Christian attorney, I was frustrated with that. But now, as I look at the Trinity, it's right. God is not a person. God is three persons. Illustrating the Trinity by using different methods and stuff is ultimately an exercise in futility because what stymies our efforts is the fact that our God, right, is so transcendent. He's so big. His ways are higher than our ways. Like Luther said, some of his qualities are unknowable to us. There is nothing in our world that has a corresponding existence to that of the Trinity. One Christian writer said it's almost as if we live in flatland and the Trinity comes from sphere land. We just can't wrap our heads around it. But there are some beliefs that the church holds in common. One, we don't believe in three gods, but one God. We don't believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three different forms. A lot of people like to use the illustration of the egg, which I brought, but I think I smashed it while I was sitting up there. Um, But this egg has three different forms. The shell, the egg white, the egg yolk. It's not a good illustration because we believe the Father and the Son and the Spirit are of the same substance, the same essence. Third, we don't believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are parts of God. Jesus isn't one-third God, the Father one-third God, and the Holy Spirit one-third God. To sum up, God is one being existing in three persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Distinct, but yet of the same divine nature or substance. Now, there's no one passage in Scripture that gives us a complete statement of the Trinity, but I think our Gospel reading this morning from John is one place where it shows Jesus discussing in some detail the three persons of the Trinity. In it, the gospel reader John portrays this Nicodemus as a very learned man. He is a Pharisee, a member of the ruling council, and Jesus calls him Israel's teacher. He comes at night to visit Jesus. And he begins by saying, Jesus, we, we know you're a teacher sent from God. But Jesus cuts right to the chase. He tells them no one can see the kingdom of God unless you were born again. 
Now, Nicodemus kind of shows his lack of spiritual understanding because he retorts to Jesus, how can it be that someone could be born when they're old? And Jesus responds, being born again is accomplished by water and by the Spirit. In verse 8, you were born of the Spirit. Now, as we know later in this passage, Nicodemus is told in verses 15 and 16 that God the Father is the one who loves the world and who, unwilling to let it perish, gives his Son. God sends his Son not to condemn the world and all of its inhabitants, but to rescue them, to save them. Those who place their trust in Christ will have eternal life, being reborn by water and the spirit, that Greek word for spirit, pneuma. Pneuma gives life to the believers. Rebirth in the kingdom of God doesn't come by knowledge or by doctrine, but by faith. If it was by religious training, our friend Nicodemus would have no problems, right? But he is baffled that he cannot enter the kingdom of God by his own intellect. But after the crucifixion, we do see that he takes steps of commitment by coming to Jesus' burial with aloes and myrrh. Then in our Galatians passage, again we see a good illustration of the three persons of the Trinity. The Father sent his Son to rescue us from the curse, which we'll talk about in our Sunday school class later. And he sent the Spirit to indwell us and to enable us to call on God as our Father, Abba. And then finally, in our old promise reading, we hear the chorus from Isaiah, holy, 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 recognized in the early church as being Trinitarian in nature. And they used it throughout in their worship and in their praise. Now, the part we've discussed at this point is obviously difficult enough to grasp. But now I kind of want to share some of the implications of what all this means to us. If God from all eternity has been one God in three persons, what does that mean for us in our daily lives? Four years of seminary and poring over various commentaries. And I still struggle with how to explain what those implications are. Honestly, I only have a few to, <coughs> to share with you this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> hey, do you need some water? Yeah, that, thank you so much. That'd be good. Whoa! Oh, geez. you all right? You okay? Here, sit down, sit down. Uh, Have a sip. I think I'm, I think I'm okay. I, everything seems so Wait a bright. You, you hit your head. Sit down, let okay. me go get a first aid kit. Hold all right, on. thank you. Hold on. What was I saying? Something about implications, right? Somehow I need to explain what the Trinity means for us in, in real terms. If there's one God and three persons, what would those implications be? Please, God, give me some insight. Perhaps we can help? Yes, let us share some real insight into the quest that you seek. Hold it. This can't be real. You can't be real. Suppose it I is I must real. have really hurt my head. Suppose it is real. You wanted implications, didn't you? Well, yeah, I wanted to be able to preach it to them. It was supposed to be part of my sermon if you really want to know the truth. Well, let's start with the most basic implication of what you call the Trinity. God is love. Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave, I got the first eight. Hold it, you're the father. I'm the father? What? I know him. Him. What? You got to sit down. I got to go get some ice for you. You're not doing very good. Wait, wait, and I'll go get you some ice. Like I said, my son, God is love. And if God is love, he cannot be one person. Hold it. What do you mean by that? 
Such a God would not be love. He wouldn't have been love in the beginning. Love would have had to come later. Love would have been an option for such a God. But love would have been secondary. If God was only one person, such a God would be one without love. Think about that for a moment. I'm yes, thinking. Father. Yes. Because until such a God created the world, or other beings, or someone... <laughs> because love requires someone else, doesn't it, David? Well, now that you mention it, yeah, it requires, like, a parent and a child, or maybe two friends, or a husband and a wife. Exactly, my child. But for us, our very essence is love, because from all eternity, we have been a community of beings, loving one another. And glorifying one another. You see, there was never a time when we were not expressing love toward one another and receiving love from one another. Wow. My precious child, we were love before anything else existed. Love is ultimate reality. The three of us were an eternal family and an eternal friendship. Wow. We were love before we created. So, let me get this. If God was love before anything was created, and we were created in your image, well then, wouldn't love have to be the substance of all things? Wouldn't it have to be the, the meaning of all things? Exactly. You know, you've talked to enough people David, to realize that when people face death, nobody wishes they had spent more time in the office, for instance. That's true. Right, or spent more time on their career. Right. They most often wish they had spent more time with their loved ones, or their family, or they had worked harder on a broken relationship. Because if I get this right, we've been wired for love and relationships, right? Yes, David, of course, because humankind was made in our image, which that means relational. It's ultimate, it's ultimate reality. Right. You can't escape our nature. Mm. Put relationships first, David. Put your community first. Do you want another implication of the Trinity, my child? Ouch, my head. Yes, of, yes, of course I, yes. Servanthood is all important. Servanthood? I washed the disciples' feet, didn't I? That you did. So do you remember his words? That night when he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. I remember. Well, that was another insight into the Trinity. The Father glorifies the Son. The Son glorifies the Father. And the Spirit glorifies the Father and the Son. Okay. David, do you know what glorify means? I better get this right. I'm a pastor. <laughs> Don't worry. There's uh, no grade. To adore? That's right. To serve, to delight in, to bless. None of us demand glory. Instead, we give glory. Wow. There is an other person orientation within the Godhead. My son, each of the members of the Trinity defer to each other and yes. love and adore each other. Yes, Father. I just wish everybody could hear all this. <clears throat> so servanthood, <laughs> servanthood like love, is at the very heart of the universe. So this servanthood, it's, if I get it right, it means like giving up our rights, our power, so to speak? Exactly. When my son went to the cross for you and all people, he was only living out what had been going on inside the heart of us, the triune God, forever. Hmm. Interesting. And my godhood was not diminished when I obeyed the Father's will, humbled myself, came to earth, and died for you. Hmm. And my godhood was not diminished when I only speak of Jesus, 
You see, my child, the way to influence is to serve. The way up is down. The way to obtain power is to give up power, not to, not to seek or promote yourself. Like I was saying, I just wish the church could hear all this. <laughs> they can, my child, they can. How do you feel now? Well, actually, besides my head, I feel great. How do you feel now? Like I don't need Pastor Blaze's first aid kit? <laughs> <laughs> we must hurry now, our time draws nigh. But remember, child, that doctrinal balance is also important. W doctrinal balance? Yes, I said to baptize them, not just in my name, but in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All three of us need to be attended to and understood and honored if you want to live hmm. a truly Christian life. Okay. If you attend to only one or two of us, your walk will be distorted. Do you understand, my child? I think so. So don't overemphasize or underemphasize me. Okay. Or me. Or even me. Hmm. Pastor Blaze is going to be back in just a minute. But I want you to remember what I told my friends. Go make disciples. Yes. David, we want to help you to bring others into the joy of being a part of this divine and loving relationship. We have been infinitely happy and joyous forever. And we want a whole I world full of people yes. to understand that same joy and love that we share. Right. We want you to love us. All. Also, so, to love each other. Yes. So go into the world, baptizing in the name of the Father. And the Son. And the Holy Spirit. Here, here, I found some ice. Pastor Dave. I, what are you doing up? I, 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 I don't think I need it. What? I, I think I've been healed. Really? I, I think so. Healed? Hey. Yeah. Anyway, don't worry about the sermon. I think, I think it's okay. I think you said enough. Uh, well, you know the funny thing about it, Pastor Blaze? I think somehow, some way, I was able to finish the sermon. Are you sure? Well, if I didn't, then I must have been dreaming. Oh, and there's one more thing I wanted to share with you. What's that? Well, you know, I don't know everything about the doctrine of the Trinity. But I do know one thing. I wouldn't want to live in a world without a triune God. Amen to that. Please stand as we continue with the prayers of the church. Holy God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we give thanks for the mystery and wonder of your love. Draw us to yourself and help us to live humbly, to love sacrificially, and to remain connected to one another in love. Triune God, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the world you created. Make us faithful stewards of your creation and forgive us for the times that we have misused your resources. Give us wisdom to manage all you have entrusted to our care. Triune God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for the world in which we live, asking that there be times of peace and security. Give local and national and world leaders to lead with discernment and uphold justice in our communities and between the nations. Triune God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, grant healing and relief to those that are suffering from physical and mental illness. Comfort and restore those whose hearts are lonely, broken, or in despair. Keep them mindful of your ever-abiding presence, mercy, and compassion. Triune God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give thanks for the men and women who have died while serving our nation. We pray that their sacrifice will continue to serve the cause of peace, freedom, and justice for your children in the whole world. Comfort those who grieve and grant them your peace. Triune God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be present with us, Lord, and make your church alive with the desire to share the good news. Serve the needy 
and pray without ceasing. Rule our hearts and minds and help us to extend to others the same forgiveness and grace that you so graciously bestowed on us through your Son, triune God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Compassionate God, hear our prayers and send your peace, love, and healing into the lives of those for whom we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we should always give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, who with your Son and the Holy Spirit are one God and one Lord. Together you have created and sustained the universe. Together you have saved humanity from sin and from every evil, from the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Redeemer. By his blood we are redeemed and restored as sons and daughters of the King. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the com company of heaven, let us laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, for you have had mercy and unfailing love. You foresaw our need for redemption and sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to ransom us from sin, death, and Satan. By his perfect life, death, and cross, and glorious resurrection, you have paved the way for our redemption and for our life eternal in your kingdom. As we gather at your table, help us to come with grateful and repentant hearts. Forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit, and gather us together with all the faithful who have preceded us to see your glory in the eternal kingdom. To you alone, O oh Father, be all glory and honor and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, This cup is the new covenant given for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, gracious Father, for you have lavishly refreshed us through the saving and renewing gift of your Son's body and blood. Strengthen us through this blessed gift and grant that we faithfully respond to the workings of the Spirit within us. Lead us to graciously serve you and grow in love with you and with one another. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Pastor Dave, don't fall over. <laughs> Next steps. Got to watch these steps. Evolutionists question how and when humanity acquired the capacity to love. Some of the greatest scientists just don't explain it at all. Some say it's about us passing on our genes. Some say it's no more than a result of hormones. But you and I know the reason why we have the capacity to love. Because we were created by a triune God who has been forever in love and in community. You, you know, Pastor Blaze, um, in that dream sequence I had, it seems so real. And it's... Uh, hold it. Will, you were in it. Me? Yeah. And, and, and Brendan, you were in it. Yeah. Stephen, you were in it too. Now, Dave, you didn't go to Kansas. Okay. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he look down upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Serve the Lord! <laughs>